This is going to be a great episode to listen to. Welcome to this episode of Strata Originals Podcast. I'm excited to be here with Sherry Orell. She is the founder and CEO of Next Level Catapult. And I love that name for a company because she really did catapult herself in her own career. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. So you've been referred to as an accidental rule breaker and the how hard can it be girl, woman. Why don't you tell us how you started because your story is fascinating. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I, I was just a curious kid and threw myself into whatever seemed interesting and was raised in a pretty normal, you know, middle-class blue collar family. And my parents didn't go to college, and that was not the expectation for any of their kids. It wasn't something we talked about. There was no finances there to support it. So it wasn't an expectation that I had. My expectation was to graduate high school and figure out a way to support myself and become a productive member of society. So I had a series of, of jobs leading into my first professional role, which was a receptionist at what at the time, I just thought it was a marketing company and turned out to be a, a division of a, a recently acquired division of News Corporation. And answering the phones was no great challenge. And quickly, I got bored and asked for more and asked for more. And eventually, they gave it to me. And I think within three weeks, I was promoted, pulled off the front desk to, to do a role as an account coordinator, calling on major... Uh, CPG accounts like Ralston Purina and others and got my feet wet really quick. That led to a sales journey because the next best space from client service was to do the sales itself. And that really started me on my, on my way. So I just would find myself in situations that I was a bit fearless and would ask myself the questions, how hard can it be? And course make mistakes and course correct and hit barriers and figure out a way around them but I kept going and I kept climbing all the way to the corner office I've been a CEO in multiple companies and it's been a really great journey and you're also currently an investor as well yes I do love my passion projects so when there is a founder that I really believe in I often do some early stage angel investing and also put sweat equity skin in the game I, I tend to look at investments where I feel like my experience and contribution could be additive to the outcome. So yes, and I've invested in several companies. What would you say was one of the biggest highlights that you said to yourself, I've done it. I made it. I, I've, I've got, I've done that jump. Now I can, there's, the possibilities are endless. I think it was probably my first CEO role. I had been with the company for three or four years. We were private equity held a couple of times during my, my tenure. And I was in a position, which is very typical with post-acquisition situations at companies, where the founder was excited about his windfall and very entrepreneurial. So he was focused on some other projects, which left a lot of the running of the base business to me as head of sales and marketing. And I was ready to lead officially. I was doing most of the CEO role without the official title or the comp. So I made a little bit of a power play. Uh, by default, I had been given another offer to go become a president of, of a different company, but they required a full release of my non-compete. So I had to take a little bit of a middle of the road approach when I shared this news with my current employer. And that ultimately catapulted, since you like that word, yeah. uh, the opportunity for me to take over as president and then shortly after CEO. So it was an interesting dynamic and it happens in business, but more frequently people come into a new company as a CEO, right? The idea of promoting from within isn't as commonplace. Yep. And often brings with it the baggage, right? Everybody knew me as who I was and in my former role. And, and I had to come into business and really put on a completely different hat. Instead of saying, this is what we do. I need to figure out a way to monetize it. For the first time I was sitting and saying, why do we do this? Does it make sense? Which elements of the business are actually driving profit and revenue and which are a drain? So I had to completely 
look at the business com uh, in a, from a different angle, we ultimately transitioned. Uh, at, at the time I took over the business, about 90% of our revenue was coming from a single tactic that was dying. And it was pretty clear that it was dying. So over the seven to eight years that I ran it before we sold it to a strategic, we really reinvented ourselves from within under the brand name. Uh, but we completely changed uh, what we did and were able to keep the rev revenue generally consistent, even though we were exiting businesses and entering new ones. Now, that was the a big pivot. That it was a huge pivot. It was a yeah, and and one of the things that really compelled me to to launch my current business with the the management consulting firm with Next Level Catapult is that I had some great people. There was loyalty on both sides. There was work ethic, but these people were trained with blinders on because we did certain things. Every business does certain things. And so the hammer, you know, when it, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. I didn't want to have to fire everybody that I really respected just to go get people with new skills. So not only was there a training gap as we entered the digital age and more technology forward facing uh, tech services, but they had to begin to unconsciously make decisions every day through this new lens. And I became fascinated with how the brain works, how habits are developed, how behaviors are learned and unlearned. And I was running this company, we, we were private equity held and they were not throwing money at us. Everything had to be self-funded. So I didn't have resources to bring in all these experts that actually had legit training and experience in how to do this. So we really had to figure out how to do this ourselves. So every book that I read, I was making a PowerPoint presentation and trying to figure out how to foster this core team of, of us through this significant change and also get our clients to start thinking of us differently. How did we have to, what did we have to do? How did we have to change our behavior? What did we have to present differently so that our clients would believe that these new capabilities and skills were authentic, not just, you know, some, something we were pretending that we were. So that was, I, pro I think, probably one of the most fascinating journeys during that, during that period of, of and, and when we sold, seven, eight years later to this strategic, we had every one of our core team from the pivot was still with the company, which is something I was really proud of. Now, one of the things that you like to talk about, which is our core business is personal branding. Yes. And you have some, and you use the behavioral science that you've read about and figured out um, in that. So can you yes. tell us about that? I was fascinated. Yeah. yeah, I think the first book that stands out in my mind is, is setting me on this journey was The Power of Habit by Charles Durig. Uh, it, he was a journalist or is a journalist and, and certainly presented the science side of it, but it really laid it out in layman's terms and it opened my mind to the power of the human brain. And set me on a journey that, you know, a couple stops with Tony Robbins and a few others and just really anything I could get my hands on about identity and behavior change. So during this critical process at this company where we were making this seven to eight year pivot, I applied a lot of these learnings and at the essence was able to package a, a more simplified process than years of neuro, neurotherapy, right, cognitive behavioral therapy that would give people some practical steps of, of ways that they could question the meaning that they give to certain beliefs that they have, give them the information that they actually have power and can control the meaning, and systematically tackle each area of their life, professionally or personally, to work on the, the change of that meaning and assigning the right emotions to those circumstances so that how we react and respond becomes unconscious and authentic. The hardest thing to do, I feel, is to rely on willpower. Willpower sucks. And willpower is a great crutch towards habit development because it takes willpower to force yourself to do certain things that eventually, ideally, if done correctly, will begin to become unconscious behavior that you no longer have to rely on willpower. Right. So it's like I use this example. If you want to, if you want to become a runner, right, you can set out. Maybe you're going to train for a marathon. That's your tactic. 
for your strategy of becoming a runner. So you're going to have a schedule, you're going to get some great shoes, you join a running club, you do all these things that Runner's Magazine would tell you to do to train for a marathon. But you could complete that marathon and still not be a runner. You could never run again. So if you're not applying the right meaning and the right out desired outcome at the outset of a desire change, you're, you're not necessarily going to achieve your end goal. So being really crystal clear on, on what it is that you want to become and then having a tactical approach to achieving that is, is really something I'm very passionate about. And I've seen this approach work with just hundreds of, of professionals that, that are benefiting from this sort of awareness of this gift that we really have this power mentally to, to control some of our own outcomes and destiny. So just to give a visual example, um, you've seen this applied with someone who had road rage that they didn't. Yes. And yes. So can you just tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. So I was teaching a, a group, these principles, and um, I asked for some examples so we could use a real life situation. And this guy who we all knew and my old man or John shared with us the shocking revelation that sometimes when people cut him off, he just just it gets enraged, right? Your typical road rage, he'll speed up, he'll probably flip him the bird and he may cut him off. He just, he becomes this incredible Hulk version of his mild manner um, self. And, you know, his wife freaks out, his daughter in the back seat is crying, whatever. And he hates the way that he feels after he's done it, but he just can't help himself, even though he's promised himself, he's, he's gonna keep it together. So I, through a series of questions, was able to uncover the meaning, the why behind what would send him into such a rage. And after probing questions and getting deeper and deeper, you know, well, of course, all the obvious, oh, well, they're driving dangerous and they could hurt somebody. And who do they think they are? And they're breaking the law, all the obvious. When we got to the essence, as often in human nature, it was somewhere on the insecurity trajectory, right? Who does this person think they are? They think they're better than me. They think they're more important than me. I, I feel less than when somebody disrespects me. And when that is the meaning that you give to something, the emotions that you feel are pretty predictable, regardless of race, gender, age, ethnicity. None of, if, if any of us are offended, whatever that definition of feeling offended is, and whatever the catalyst, the emotions that a human as are normal and expected. We could fill in the blanks. Now, if reacting to those emotions is going to be a disservice to us, sometimes we'll use that willpower like, okay, don't say anything. Keep it, keep it together. Don't let it bother you. All those willpower words. But if we could actually change the meaning and, and over a period of time and repetition, get our brains to believe and embrace this meaning, even when it's not true, it'll serve us. So for John, I recommended that he start to think of these people as heroes. There goes a hero. He's probably off to deliver a baby or save a cat from a tree or something. You, you of course, kind sir, please, please cut in front of me, even though the lane two miles ago that it was ending and you waited until the cones to cut in front of me, please, by all means. So, so over time, he employed this practice. And uh, of course, it sounded ridiculous to him at first, as all of these mind hacks, these brain hacks. But upon checking back with him six, nine months later, he said that this had now become kind of a family joke that he, there goes the hero, never gets upset. He, it, it's a joke. Even his daughter will notice from the back seat if somebody's driving erratically, she'll like, look, daddy, there's a hero. So he turned it into something empowering for him that no longer threw him into a rage, took him out of whatever positive mental state he may have been in before that incident. And he is now in control of that situation. But that's just a tool, right? The tool to address his road rage what if he's got issues with his mother-in-law? What if there's a coworker that just sets him off, right? It's the same exact process that we can use time and time again. Yeah. And how long did that take? The repositioning for of him? It? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was it was a good 6 to 9 months later. Uh, and you know, there's different schools of thought as to how long it takes for true habit development. Some will say 45 days, some will give you 30, some will say 90, uh, but there has to be a period of repetition 
but not willpower based repetition. Right. If you are working against yourself during this process, it will be a struggle. And I'll give you a quick example of when I decided I needed to pick up running as a, as a, as an exercise because it was the most efficient way to burn the most calories. And I was a single mom with a four-year-old living in New York city, CEO of a company. I didn't have a lot of time. I wrongly disliked running. I was a sprinter, a gymnast, a volleyball player running for a mile seemed like punishment. So I had a really bad attitude about it when I would do it. And I struggled. There was a path that I would take regularly. that was about three miles a very reasonable distance for somebody to run. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't run the whole thing without having to stop. And I would do all the tricks of I'm just going to run to the next light post or whatever. I just couldn't do it, which is frustrating because I'm, you know, kind of a goal oriented person and competitive. And it was frustrating to me. So I was having dinner with a friend and we were talking about squeezing in workouts when you have mommy guilt. And I mentioned that I was running and she said, oh, I didn't realize you were a runner. And my, of course, reaction was, I am not a runner. I only do this because it's the fastest way to burn calories. I hate it. And I realized that I wasn't practicing what I preached because while I was running, when I was getting ready to run, I had this song that would go through my head, which was like, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate. So I was reinforcing that what I was physically doing was in complete opposite of my identity. I wasn't a runner. And when I finally realized that my internal self-talk was sabotaging me, I changed my little thong in my head to a more positive mantra. How lucky I am. I'm so grateful I'm healthy, you know, blah, blah, blah. I changed it to a positive mantra and I would play that over in my head the first few minutes of my run. And then it would sort of fade to the background while I'm planning my life as we all do when we're exercising. And within two weeks, I put my shoes on, did my run, and finished and realized I had run the whole thing and it was three miles. And I had been running for a year. And in just two weeks of mental mindset, I had overcome the barriers that I was unconsciously putting in front of myself by changing my meaning of this being a gift that I was giving to myself and my future and my child and my health, rather than being this frustratingly painful thing that I had to do because I wanted to look good in my clothes, (laughs) right? So the meaning was the catalyst to the habit. That's amazing. And so people could use that reframing in almost every part of their lives. Absolutely. And absolutely. Like it's more, it's important for, you know, when you're developing your personal brand and who you are, because you want to be authentic. So you want to change those parts of you that aren't as nice so that you can be authentic. Uh, And I get that, but we all have our things, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, your thing was running, you know, maybe it's about food. Maybe it's about anything like name it. It's just really reframing and, and looking at the benefits of the doing it the right way. Is that kind of, am I? Yeah. I mean, the words that I use are, are your current behaviors serving you? Because some things that maybe even be perceived as a little negative, if they're serving you today, like I've worked with, with clients who, who sometimes we delve into the personal side of their lives and, and they may have a, a challenge with a relationship, right? And if maybe they don't get along with somebody, maybe they're not talking to somebody in their family, maybe they don't talk to their brother. Well, on the surface, you can say, oh, gosh, whenever you're estranged from a family member, that can't be good. So what do we need to do to mend fences and clear the air? But at this particular stage of this person's life, not having a relationship with a certain person may be serving them. And so just cut yourself a break, right? Lean into the fact that you've made a conscientious decision that for this period of time in your life and never say never, it's, it's not a relationship that's serving you and doesn't warrant and justify any guilt on your part or, or burning any calories worrying about it, right? But in, in other situations, you know, we being authentic, I think when people hear about being their authentic self, they go to the idea of this is just who I am and you're going to have to accept me for who I am and I have to accept me for who I am and I have to be comfortable with these gaps and failures 
or these negative perceptions because you know the good and the bad, right? Whereas you can reframe for yourself. First of all, ask your question, is this behavior serving me? Right. Yeah. Let's just say somebody, uh, let's just take somebody who ha- actually has social anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. So I am someone who has social anxiety. So when I go to a situation, I know that going in, I walk through the door as a socially anxious person. I'm hesitant when I am shy. This, the number of times I have said I in that person's self description of their social anxiety is working against them. Right now, I'm not saying you're going to heal yourself, but if you change that to say, I am somebody that goes into a situation and I'm very deliberate when I enter a room, the first thing that I do is I go and I get a drink. I scan the room. I look for a friendly face. I force myself to go and have an introduction conversation. Every meeting I meet three people, all of a sudden you're in charge of your social anxiety. You're the, you're the driver. You're not the victim. You're the hero of your own approach to how you deal with social situations. That definition, that label is not serving you, right? So let's stop thinking about it in ways that hold us back and start thinking about things that we can feel empowered by. Yeah, and I I think the key to that is how is it serving you? Professionally and personally, the the personality dynamic when you have conflict or Uh, incongruency with with personalities uh, can seem more intense at work because what's riding on it is very emotionally charged what's riding on your your ability to be perceived as great at your job is a promotion is more compensation is recognition is security right? These are primal human needs that we often as business leaders forget that exist and need to be acknowledged and managed, right? So when when you're annoyed as a manager because your direct report A just got an office, but your direct report B didn't get an office and they're in there demanding, wanting to know why they didn't get the office. As a manager, you might be frustrated that you've got to justify why you make decisions and, and coddling and all the things that you would try to do to redirect that person. But really understanding at the essence is this person probably believes that this is a negative reflection on them. They are on the defense. This is insecurity that is, that is speaking. So, so what do I need to say and what do I need to address to get at the essence of this isn't about a 12 by 12 foot room with a door. Yeah. So if you just simply say, well, you'll get the next office that's available, that's really not addressing any of the underlying needs of this person, right? So what is it that you need to do to say, to help this person understand you'll qualify for an office when you achieve some of these things, there may be actual reasons why they didn't get the office. We need to see some growth. So let's, let's put the ball in your court you know, Bob, these are the three things that I need to see from you in the next six months. So let's make a plan. Let's check in once a month and let's put it, put it on the calendar today to review this in six months and see where we're at. And then all of a sudden you've given, you've empowered them instead of deflated them. But, but understanding the the reason behind the reaction professionally is really critical. Uh, And a lot of times we shy away from those touchy feely soft skills when it comes to the business environment. And quite honestly, that's not flying with the younger, the younger generation. I mean, I remember a day when if you were on the phone with somebody and you heard a dog in the background, that was a reflection of somebody's lack of professionalism, right? You didn't have dogs. You, you didn't take calls from home. And we have evolved as a society. And we as managers, particularly those of us who have been around a few blocks, you know, our back in the day attitude isn't flying with this new generation. So if we wanna motivate them, if we want loyalty, if we want retention, we've gotta polish up on some of these soft skills or we're definitely gonna be missing the mark and our talent's gonna be walking out the door. Absolutely, and it's about experience and surroundings and culture. And, you know, I just had a thought when you were talking about, uh, you know, employee A getting the office. It could even be something as simple as employee A has a really loud voice and they're disturbing other people, <laughs> right? So we Could need be. to in an office and shut the door. So 
for employee B to be insecure about that. I mean, it might be something as simple as we're working on your office. It's nothing that you've done or haven't done, but you know, it's, it's just explaining and communicating really. Right. It is. And when manager EQ evolves, and this is some of the things that, that I teach you as a manager should understand in advance when a domino tips, what is likely to happen based on the people you have. You should have known that Bob was going to be questioning the why behind the decision. And so get out in front of it. So perhaps right before you make the announcement, you pull Bob in and say, I wanted to share some information and some insights so you understand the drivers to the decision and what it means for you. So we're giving Sally the office because she's loud and she's distracting. And I know that's not a great reason to give somebody what is perceived as, as a promotion or a leg up or a, uh, an advancement, but that's the decision that we're making. I would love to find an office for you. We don't have one right now. And that's all I have for you, but I didn't want you to wonder why this decision was made. Is that, is that helpful to you, right? Now you haven't given that five, 15 minutes, five days, five months, of potentially unspoken distraction and frustration because Bob might not come to you and vent. Bob just might vent to his coworkers. Bob might look for another job. Bob might phone it in and start clocking out at five o'clock because if I'm not perceived as worthy for an office, then you're just going to get what you pay me for, right? So this EQ that we can get to be ahead of some of these situations is critical as we evolve as managers, particularly of younger, younger people. Yeah. And it's always with every generation, it's a new thing. Yep. It's like managing kids these family. days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it was funny that you said back in the day, because I was thinking about when you were talking about your story, do you think if you had to, if you were to be starting today, whether you would be able to catapult the way you did then? Oh my gosh. Well, if I was starting today, age appropriate, right? If I was graduating college right now, who knows who I would be, right? Environmentally, I would have grown up with a smartphone in my hand, right? Like, and, and my brain would have developed differently. My expectations would have developed differently. So I, I do believe if I started today with who I was when I was 20, I'd be running circles around a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, because I think, you know, my desires were very specific. I didn't grow up with a lot of money. My, my having a career was not something that occurred to me. I didn't realize I had a career until I'd had a career for probably seven or eight years. And I was like, I guess this is a career, not just a, a paycheck that I get every other week to, to pay my bills. But my, my goal was to make enough money that my future children would never know when payday was. That was my goal professionally because we knew where payday was growing up yeah. based on the amount of food there was in the house and you know the stress on my mom's face. And that was something I didn't wanna to have to experience. That was my entire aspiration for my career. Um, and I was really driven by that. And just because I had a little money in the bank, I didn't take the foot off the, the, the pedal and I still have that um, scarcity mentality to this day after, after great success. You know, if I had grown up in a different environment, like my my son, he does not have a scarcity mentality. Let's <laughs> just get that clear. Um, but he's driven in his own way. So, you know, I do, you know, listen, I'm, I'm like a lot of us of our generation where we look at the choices that these these younger people are making and, and they're different than ours. I remember the first time, and this was probably 15 years ago, the first time a fresh out of college candidate during an interview, had the, quote, audacity to ask me what the work-life balance looked like within the company. And prior to that, I mean, even if you, even if that occurred to you to be a question, you never, because of course, I don't remember exactly what my answer is, but it sounded something like, oh, work-life balance. You work your tail off for 30 years and then maybe you can take your foot off the gas a little bit and coast. That's how we, you know, which is not, not a great answer and <laughs> probably not true, but, but we, you know, we started seeing that shift and that is, that is a struggle for those older school leaders that 
that have that attitude of just work and, you know, put, put in the hours, you should be here burning the midnight oil because this is how you get ahead in life. Whereas the younger generation's expectations of, you know, I want to be able to be to the gym by six o'clock and, you know, eating dinner by seven 30 and in bed by, you know, nine 45, which was different than when I was growing up. Yeah. And I think a lot of the story that you're talking about is really Gen X relatable. And I think I said that sure. before because it's, it's the, how hard could it be? I mean, we drank water from a hose. We were outside all day. We were not coddled. I don't think any Gen X I know ever saw any kind of counselor or uh, psychiatrist or psychologist, probably into their thirties, maybe forties, because it was just deal with it. And yeah, I, I feel Suck like it, up. it was just, you put in the hours you need to put in and you work until you can't work anymore and then you go home and sleep and that's just the way it was and like that's the way it was for my whole career and then and then I became an entrepreneur and I'm dealing with a new several new generations and it's a totally different mindset so it's yeah for sure I wish I'd had this conversation with you probably well maybe you didn't know this conversation but 10 years ago because it would have been really helpful because when millennials yeah. were coming on the scene, it was a whole new thing. But now we have millennials, Gen Y, yeah. Gen Z, and it's all good. It's all good. It's all right happening. now. I'm working with a, a cohort of I think nine twenty somethings. Um, these are all second generation of successful CEOs. The, the, the kids that also were not, you know, aware of payday. Uh, but they're, you know, wanting to make their mark in the world. And this, this type of growth work, the one thing that I'm really excited about, about this generation is they are more open to this power of mindset and manifestation than probably any other generation. So while they, they have different approaches to work-life expectations, they are probably the most growth-minded group. And it's just so exciting to see them eat this up like sponges because it's, it's rewarding. It's why you and I became entrepreneurs to get into the, you know, the people helping side of the business. Uh, and when, when you see that this particular generation, they're more, they're more pliable, they're probably a little bit more gullible, but then they're also more jaded at the same time, right? They almost don't believe anything they see or hear because of social media and fake news and everything else. But on the other hand, when it comes to this, this neuroscience scientific side, um, they're, they're leaning into it without as much resistance. And so I, I'm, I'm really excited that, that that is a dynamic that's more available in this current generation that I think we would have been like, ah, get over it, you know? And, <laughs> and now they're, they're much more interested in bringing that EQ element into their lives, which means these are also the next generation of leaders. So imagine when they're 30. And imagine when they're 40 and they are showing up with empathy and with insight. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting shift to, to the corporate environment. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. It's exciting when you see that shift happen, when they're open to these kinds of things. So I just have one last question I want to ask. It's an icebreaker. We always do it. Sherry, if you had your own late night talk show, who would be your first guest? Dead or alive? Real or not? Dead or alive? Um, I struggle with questions like these, but I, I tend to lean towards those people who might have information that we don't, insights that we don't. So maybe somebody like Abraham Lincoln to really understand what was going on, what were some of the drivers that were, were happening, things that didn't get documented. It would be really interesting to see what was the the real dynamic during that period of American history. If he'd actually spill the tea. Oh, it would, I, it would be a requirement of coming on my show. I'm, I'm a very <laughs> demanding show host. I'm sure he would be. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry, it's been such a pleasure. I feel like I could go on for another hour with you. It's There's just so much here. But thank you very much for being here today and teaching us so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye.